So, <clears throat> Willem Marinus Dudok, 1884-1974, he even lived for a long time, uh, reached the age of 90, and uh, Hermann Herzberger, who is still alive, is uh, 89 today. So not only that, at least some of them live long lives, but they also live very creatively. So uh, Willem, uh, Willem, uh, Willem Marinus Dudok, uh, born as you see, July 6th, was a D Dutch modernist architect. He was born in Amsterdam. He became city architect for the town of Hilversum in 1928, where he was best known for the brick Hilversum town hall completed in 1931, which is quite a remarkable building. Not only did he design the building, but also the interior, including the carpets, furniture, and even the mayor's meeting hammer. I wonder that is the meeting hammer is, I mean, I, I, maybe for auctions you need a hammer, but for a mayor, anyway, I guess it's the same thing. He also designed and built about 75 houses, public buildings and entire neighborhoods. What distinguishes him also is that initially he trained uh, as a military. So he came from, from the army to, to architecture. Interesting. So this was the man. Uh, yeah, one of those Dutch uh, architects. You can find uh, a lot of information about him on the web. Drawings. Some drawings by Mr. Dudok. Uh, again, he was born in the 19th century, so, uh, you know, his modernism was uh, maybe not uh, as radical as one would expect, but for that time it was radical. And he built, for example, this um, uh, department store in Rotterdam, which was destroyed in the war, and it's such a shame because it was a brilliant building. And, and uh, the drawing uh, is almost identical with, uh, with how the building looked like when it was built. So very sad. And when will human beings renounce wars? When? Well, you know, from the perspective of today, such a drawing might look a little bit, um, you know, sentimental or old fashioned or, but again, we have to consider the time when it was made, about 100 years ago. Again, this drawing of, of, of the building that was built and then it was destroyed. Now, this is a, um, one of his best known buildings, the City Hall in Hilversum, 1928-1931. There was some influence coming from the, the United States, from, uh, from uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, it's an excellent building and uh, maybe, maybe, maybe this tower is a little bit too emphatic, but as a whole is some kind of an urban um, organicism, which I, I admire, and, and the Dutch did absorb the lesson of Frank Lloyd Wright and applied it to the context of the country. A large building. Well, a city hall. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very well preserved. I mean, it's 90 years old. And uh, look at this, it's, it's fresh. It looks uh, brand new, so to speak. The look at these details, you know, uh, I mean, very refined, you know, especially from a military man, you know, you wouldn't expect an army man to have such sophistications here. Uh, I think Wright would have admired this building and maybe he did if he knew of it. And maybe he knew of it in 1931 uh, uh, Frank Lloyd White was young and restless. I mean, he was about uh, 65 years old, but still young and restless. He had, uh, Frank Lloyd White had a strange um, saying. He said, 
it is foolish to drink until you are 50 and it is foolish not to drink after 50. I, I don't know exactly what he meant. I mean, I understand what he meant, but uh, maybe he was right. I don't know. I'm a little bit perplexed because I only drink buttermilk. I didn't drink alcohol in 30 years, which is maybe uh, shameful. And maybe he would have uh, uh, commented on this uh, sarcastically. Anyway, the city hall of Mr. Dudok, the father of uh, America, of, uh, of Dutch modernism. And uh, this, you know, the, the, this Dutch, they work with a brick unbelievably well. I mean, they, they had and still have craftsmen who can, who can uh, weave uh, a wall with bricks brilliantly. It's much, it must be very joyous when you, when you wake, when you can live creatively. And, uh, Unfortunately, not everybody has these chains, but uh, some people do. Well, I guess you have to fight for these chains. It's not given to you, you know. It doesn't come from God directly. It has to, you have to labor, you have to work. But the contest counts too, you know. What do you do when you have uh, countless impediments or a totalitarian figure like uh, the Romanian uh, president before 1989? who knew everything about everything and uh, it was impossible to innovate. Even reflected in the water, uh, the building looks nice. Willem Dudok, Martinus Dudok, the father of Dutch modernism in architecture. Very, very elegant, an elegant uh, city hall. No infiltrations of water, although the water touches the wall. Uh, but I don't know, in some mirac miraculous way, there is no uh, advancing of the water into the thickness of the wall through capillarity great technicians. I wish I had a picture with the mayor's uh, hammer. Uh, I'm actually curious. I, 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 I forgot to search for it. the building and its reflection or its negative. The Dutch are interesting because they, they have the reputation of being uh, very pragmatic and they probably are. But at the same time, somehow, at the peak of pragmatism, they become idealists, or in some cases that they, they do. This is a school, 1921, 1922. It's kind of the same architectural language, but it's still impressive, I would say.
Another, another school, this one different from the previous one, and red or reddish, which makes it uh, kind of uh, alarming a little bit for a school. It looks more like an anti-school, I mean, in terms of color. Now, this is the department store that uh, I mentioned at the beginning and which unfortunately it was destroyed in the Second World War. And look at this, it's like in the drawing. And look at the cars in front of the building and look at the building. I mean, the building looks futuristic even by today's standards and the cars look so obsolete. I mean, they are nice for the romantic soul and for the nostalgic, but... Uh, <laughs> And I, I noticed this before, you know, the discrepancy between um, the car aesthetics and the building aesthetics in, in the case of the innovative architects. The building looks, if you build a building like this today, it would be published immediately on all, um, uh, through all channels. And, uh, and, and, and yet this was done, you know, before the Second World War. Excellent building. Another great achievement of the of the Second World War to to destroy it. I mean, look, the drawing and the building. There's no difference, except you know that maybe the color was also like in the drawing. I don't know. At least the walls. But an excellent building, yes. Maybe, you, you know, Europe should decide only the Dutch to build, you know, for all the countries and the, the architects from other countries to, you know, watch TV, play chess, uh, fish, and allow the Dutch to build for everybody. I'm not saying that there are no good architects in some other countries, there are, but not too many. And uh, I think the Dutch are remarkable. Plus, they have so much talent that uh, they can spare it with, uh, you know, other countries. A monument, 1932. Uh, I forgot. Um, I, I, when I presented this last year, we had with us two architects who taught at the Delft uh, University and. Uh, one of them explained to me, but I forgot exactly what this monument stood for. Anyway, this is the building near the highway and the sea. By Mr. Dudok. Cité Universitaire, Collège Néerlandais, uh, Paris, Paris uh, France, 1939. So built uh, again before the Second World War. Here there are also some buildings, two buildings by Le Corbusier and, uh, you know. Anyway, this is by Mr. Dudok. It was uh, refurbished. It can be a little bit tiring that always approaching the corner, he has this uh, vertical element. It's, it's a little bit manneristic, but uh, I guess it's okay. Uh, he has qualities in his work and we can forgive him certain misgivings.
plus uh, father always makes mistakes because the father is um, you know a beginner and at the beginning uh, you make sometimes mistakes at least from the perspective of the son and the daughter the father uh, is uh, a little bit deficient sometimes in some respects yet he remains the father the Führer I don't know if this is him or not. It might be. Now, last year when I made a presentation, one of the architects who taught at Delft and one is from Indonesia and her husband from Germany. And uh, they told us that uh, the map the map where Indonesia was chosen, I like, was shown like here. Well, they said that uh, in the colonies, the Dutch uh, represented themselves graphically as being a bigger country than it actually was. And the coloni colonized land was shown as being smaller than it actually was, you know. So from the perspective of the, of the so-called winner, um, uh, the, the actual facts were distor distorted. I like the lamps, interesting lamps in a way. Um, I don't know if he designed them, but from considering what I read at the beginning that he designed everything, I imagine it, they were designed by him. Now, this was refurbished, of course. So, Cité Université, uh, Paris, Dudok, William Martinus Dudok. Some playfulness of an ornamental uh, kind, uh, why not? And the plan labored as, as it is. Now, from the fluidities of today, this might appear static. But again, we have to consider that it was built more than 70 years ago. This is a, a, you know, a typical student's room. Uh, we used to, I mean, we, I went to Vienna with uh, about 300 uh, students from Romania, mostly from Bucharest and the, the rooms we slept in were almost identical with what we see here. So I, I wonder if the architect who designed those in Vienna didn't inspire himself from, from this work by Dudok. It's possible. Cite, City Theatre in Utrecht, 1941. This is not so remarkable. But uh, sometimes even unremarkable buildings can be remarkable if seen from a different point of view or, or different uh, perspective. Now, he designed also several gas stations for the American company, Exxon. This is one of them. Uh, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, you know, uh, joyous, maybe too joyous for a gas station. I don't know. But at that time, there was, there was faith in, uh, in, in gasoline. I mean, people... Uh, saw things in an optimistic way. So I guess this gas station was supposed to look optimistic as well. 
And this is a uh, um, city hall from 1965 and is the last image of this short presentation on the father of modernism in, in the Netherlands. I like this work, you know, it's uh, even without words, you would say it must be kind of like a city hall and it is a city hall. Uh, I wish I had more images, but sometimes when you have only one image, it, uh, it remains with you in a, in a more persistent way. So, Willem Martinus Tudok, happy birthday to you and uh, happy birthday to modernism in, in the Netherlands. Now we go to the Japanese uh, and we'll end with Herzberger. We go to this interesting Japanese man who considered himself the eternal outsider. I like this. I thought it was me who was that, but I see that uh, Shusaku Arakawa thought uh, of himself in the same way. But I, maybe he had less reasons than I would do. Anyway, 1936, 2010, he died at 74. Uh, this was the man, and I, I truly think someone like him could encourage maybe all of us to think out of the box, to enjoy architecture even outside of the confines of uh, the predictable uh, path uh, described and uh, sometimes dogmatically traced by, uh, by schools. So he studied uh, medical science, I mean medicine and, uh, and, and mathematics. Then he became an artist and then, well, he was lucky. He met the, the woman of his dream, a philosopher and a poet. And together for 40 years, they created some very original works and uh, also in architecture, some sig significant uh, things. Here they are, the two of them. She does look like an interesting woman, uh, a dreamer, but uh, we need dreamers. And uh, I, she probably had a, a positive influence on him. They created a, a, a beautiful uh, partnership, a little bit on the dreamy side, and you'll understand what I refer to, but we need, we need dreamers, we need dreams. And uh, they were able to achieve these dreams, you know, to, to, to build some uh, astonishing buildings which normally would not be built. Uh, I mean, someone who goes through years and years and years of study in schools would probably not even think of building such buildings. Such buildings came into being from people who were kind of outsiders. So Shusaku Arakawa, born, as you see, July the 6th, was a Japanese artist and architect. Well, who made him an architect? I would say God made him an architect. No ORA, no schools, but uh, God himself. He had a personal and artistic partnership with writer and artist Madeleine Jeans that spanned more than four decades. Shusaku Arakawa, who spoke of himself <clears throat> as an eternal outsider and an abstractionist of the distant future. I like this, an abstractionist of the distant future, first studied mathematics and medicine at the University of Tokyo and art at the Musashino, Musashino Art University. He was a member of Tokyo's Neo-Dadaism organizers, a precursor of the Neo-Dada movement. That ne the Dada movement, as we know, two Romanians had a significant role there, Tristan Sara and Marcel Iancu, Marcel Iancu who, who was an architect. Arakawa's early works were first displayed in the infamous Yomiuri Independent Exhibition, a watershed event for post-war Japanese avant-garde art. Uh, Arakawa arrived in New York City in 1961 with $14 in his pocket and the telephone number for Marcel Duchamp, whom he phoned from the airport and with whom he eventually formed a close friendship. Beautiful. He started using diagrams within his paintings 
as philosophical, philosophical propositions. Jean-Francois Lyotard, an important psychoan French psychoanalyst, said of Arakawa's work that it makes us think through the eyes. And Hans Georg Gadamer, a very important um, uh, phenomenologist, I mean philosopher, described it as transforming the usual constancies of orientation into a strange enticing game, a game of continually thinking out. Ah, I am with these people, you know, uh, an important phenomenologist, an important psychoanalyst, uh, Marcel Duchamp, a uh, mad artist coming from Japan who studied mathematics and medicine. <laughs> the world can be beautiful when it is, and life itself, when it is uh, uh, lived uh, life as an adventure. And when you, when, you, when you promote your own truth and you believe in your own truth and you you, 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 you refuse to be modeled dogmatically by, uh, you know what? Quoting Paul Celan, quoting Paul Celan, the most important Romanian poet ever. I mean, sorry for Lucian Blaga and Eminescu, or for Eminescu and Lucian Blaga, they were immensely important, but Paul Celan is the best known poet born in Romania. Uh, he committed suicide at 50, uh, but he was placed in the vicinity of Goethe and Heidegger and, and uh, Hölderlin. Can you believe this? Uh, you, you know, Paul Salon, I, I, I found out about him late, late in my life. Uh, and uh, I didn't believe that, you know, he was actually uh, born uh, approximately in this land. He was Romanian. Uh, maybe I should stop here. We should read poetry by Paul Salan. Anyway, Gadamer, the, the, the phenomenologist, quoting Paul Salan, said, wrote of the work, there are songs to sing beyond the human. Beautiful again. There are songs to sing beyond the human. And just today, there was a presentation of works from Bartlett in London about the post-human architecture. So beyond the human, there are songs to sing beyond the human. Charles Bernstein and Susan B. Observe Arakawa deals with the visual field as discourse, model systems that constitute the world rather than being constituted by it. Let's uh, stop a little bit here. What does this mean? Model systems that constitute the world rather than being constituted by it. Well, this reminds me of what uh, the, the dean, uh, well, the president of the Angevante in Vienna, the University of Applied Arts, uh, wrote that um, education is supposed, to, um, is supposed to educate reality and not the other way around. In other words, education should 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 uh, have the upper hand in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in in life and not the so-called reality. Unfortunately, in our case, uh, is the opposite. You know, we think that it is reality which is supposed so-called reality which is supposed to dictate to education what to do, but other people think otherwise, and I agree with them. It, it, is, it, it is the role of edu education to, to, to transform life and to transform society and not vice versa, to have education dwarfed by the so-called reality principle. So the model systems that constitute the world rather than being constituted by it refers to that, uh, um, you know, uh, superiority of a so-called system which refuses to be manipulated and dwarfed by uh, what we mean by the word, the world. Arthur Danto found Arakawa to be the most philosophical of contemporary artists. For his part, Arakawa declared, painting is only an exercise, never more than that. Well, whatever. So, but together with Madeleine, Madeleine uh, uh, or should I read Madeleine? Uh, she, uh, they, they, 
they had a strange thought, and in my opinion, a little bit superficial. They thought that they could create an architecture that could prolong life. I imagine they were uh, searching for an architecture that, uh, in a way, was timeless, but also the people using that architecture would become themselves timeless. Of course, that was and is illusory. Um, it's it's a it's you know it's a in a way a phantasmagoria, but uh, the dream to to attain the eternal youth always existed. So they created this uh, so-called concept, the reversible destiny, and they 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 factually believed that that, that their architecture would make one live forever. Uh, unfortunately, he died not young, but uh, 74. She, I think she lived longer, but she died as well. Anyway, architecture against death. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, plainly put, this is architecture against death. Well, I wonder what the ancient Egyptians would have thought of this, you know, with, through, you know, the pyramids. Were, were the pyramids also against death? Um, in a way, they were, because they were built forever, so to speak, you know, they were advocating eternity. But that's not what they, they, they advocated, Arakawa and Jeans. For, the, for them, the ideal form of a house was one that kept residents in a perpetually tentative relationship with their surroundings. The more our homes challenge us architecturally, the more likely we are to stay young grappling with their complexities and, in the case of Arakawa and Jeans, flats and houses, their sheer oddity, even perversity, somebody wrote. Their most extreme design, the Biosclave uh, House from 2008 in East Hampton, Long Island, New York, took eight years to build and cost the couple two millions of their own money. Well, I guess they were doing well if they had so much money. Um, I don't know. I don't know how, how some people make money like this. And, you know, for a man who arrived in New York with $14 in his pocket uh, and an artist and a struggling artist, maybe she had money. I don't know. But you will see this house, the Biosleeve House Lifespan Extending Villa. That's, they built it for themselves. Uh, a Lifespan Extending Villa. That's... In my opinion, in, in this, they were rather naive, but uh, the result is uh, refreshing. The most uncomfortable house in the world, it was called. Uh, but it was the theory that discomfort makes you young because it keeps you alert. And in a way, it is true, perhaps. I mean, it was said that what, what, what doesn't kill you saves you. So the most uncomfortable house if it didn't succeed to kill you, it would have, it, it was supposed to prolong your life. This, this locative architecture, I kind of like this. That's why I, I, I uh, highlighted the word with red, this locative architecture. Maybe we should do more dislocative architectures. This locative, it's of course the, the nostalgic who loves the genius Lochi would, would protest, but, but, the house where you live forever. <laughs> this is the house where they imagined they would live forever, but uh, they didn't. I actually, it's not so interesting, in fact, you know, towards the outside, but inside it has interesting things. And again, color, 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 abundant color, and uh, those who only live uh, like white walls would uh, protest themselves. But look what they did inside, and, and, and you know, I mean, even, even the scale is disorienting, you know. It's, it's, you don't quite understand, you know, it's, it's like in Alice Wonderland, is, you know, these people are, seem to be very small and the, and the interior very big, and what's going on with, with these, uh, <laughs> this landscape within the big room, and even this, the stairs, they, they, they the dimensions seem to make uh, Neufert, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite uh, uncomfortable in his grave. Anyway, um, 
they built it for themselves. So, <laughs> I mean, I should say more about this because I have my own way of, of doing something very similar wherever I live, but not through design, more through, you know, disorder and accumulation of things that uh, are not necessarily needed, but Anyway, this is the house of uh, Mr. Arakawa and uh, Madeline, made line. Um, <laughs> but all in all, what I see here, I see the children. Now the, the, the inner child, as the um, therapist would say, uh, you know, the, the children within these two adults who uh, acted out and uh, since they used their own money, I guess it was okay. They, they obviously had money because East Hampton is an insanely expensive place. I know about East Hampton, so uh, only the rich people live there. Maybe because he became successful as an artist and if you are successful as an artist, you sell just a little black line on a white piece of paper with a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I, I'm not totally, you know, pro this building, but you'll see other things done by them. And um, there is something I think positive and valuable especially what they did. They did a, a very, very interesting park in, in, in Japan before he died. But this house is kind of interesting too, because it, you know, it brings the so-called discomfort of, of, you know, dunes and, and hills within the large space of the interior. <laughs> yeah. This, this is what happens when you allow a man who studied medicine and mathematics, then became an artist and involved with the Dada or the Neo Dada movement and uh, friends with Marcel Duchamp and so on, you know. Uh, life can be enjoyable uh, when, 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 it's live, when it is lived like this, you know, but unfortunately very few people arrive at this uh, chance to, to live so uh, adventurously. But if we compare our conception about the house and the home with what these people did, um, isn't our conception kind of dry and limiting and, uh, you know, plainly uninteresting, actually, you know? We only think of uh, petty matters, actually, you know, while you know, yes, okay, they, there is a level of opulence derived from the fact that they had the money to build it, but there is playfulness, and this is important to, to, to mention. Children who won't die by Arakawa. We, Madeleine Jeans, nice. Here is Araka, Mr. Arakawa. He doesn't seem so uh, childlike. I mean, he, no, he does, but uh, he doesn't seem so happy as his house uh, might have uh, might have proclaimed. Interesting pair, and I keep thinking that uh, that she was. Uh, I mean, he, he, I, I think she encourage the building behind him uh, was built uh, in Japan and we are going to see it an apartment building here is the dreamer the philosopher and the poet or poetess we need philosophers and we need poets and we need poetesses we need the more poetry the better today I thought of creating pockets of cultural resistance you know, to take revenge on a banal life, on a prosaic life through pockets of, of, of cultural resistance. 
it's possible. We just have to want it, to will it. Reversible Destiny Lofts in Mitaka, Tokyo. This is um, an apartment similar to the roundhouse in, in, in the States. And, but look at the building, you know, uh, a conventionally trained architect would never do something like this. For this, you need, uh, you know, uh, the, the amateur, you know, the dilettante, you need the, 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 the outsider to, to, to do something like this. The architect, the conventional uh, trained architect, conventional trained architect would, would protest, would say this is too childlike, it's infantile architecture, it's too colorful, it's it's too formal, it's too concerned with uh, superficialities, but uh, what is the alternative? The typical block of flats, which looks, uh, uh, you know, identical to many, 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 many others. That's the alternative, the viable, and look, color, color, and again, color. Why are certain schools of architecture afraid of color? I don't know. It's beyond me because you cannot have life without color. I mean, it is even said when one is lifeless, is pale. The, the, the dead one is, has no color in, in his cheeks. So why are we afraid of colors? And if color prolongs your life a little bit, uh, all for the better. But what I, what I keep questioning is, how is it possible that someone with no training at all in architecture was allowed to build? I mean, did he have the right of, of signature? Or in Japan is not needed? Strange. Yeah, no problem to build, you know, his extravagant uh, buildings and you'll see other things. This is very different actually from the certain works by Michael Graves, because Michael Graves, while he also used colors and, you know, uh, sometimes, um, you know, engaging form, so to speak, he, he employed historical precedents as inspiration, while in this case, it's, it's an almost an ahistorical architecture. Unless you 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 would consider uh, uh, geometry as being uh, historical, but it's the only so-called historical reference, the geometry they used.
Now, this is a very interesting park in, in, in Japan, the site of reversible destiny. <laughs> they are obsessed by the, <laughs> the reversible, uh, reversible uh, destiny, the site of possible library. Look at this library, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I find it very interesting. I don't know exactly what, what the, this canopy meant or means, but it is an interesting uh, structure, uh, you know. Uh, that is, these people build anything, you know, it's, it's like, I don't understand. Where do they have this freedom from? You know, uh, how come they didn't encounter opposition, you know? Uh, and you'll see other structures in this park, equally phantasmagoric and psychedelic. Did they, did they build it also with their own money? I, I, I don't know. <clears throat> the best way to get a handle on how a person is situated in the world is actually to construct, construct one, a handle expressly made for the purpose. Uh, a kind of strange way to express himself, but I guess what he meant is uh, verum ipsum factum is in the act of doing that you are constructing both the world and yourself. So, um, yeah, easy to say, difficult to do it. But this park is truly something. Uh, you will see a few things are out of this world. Not this one so much because we already saw this inside their house. In, uh, in the States, but this is the library. Look at this. Uh, and the return of the labyrinth with all its uh, scandalous provocations to the intellect. And I, I, I like labyrinths, I always did and I always will. And let us not forget that Chartres, the great Middle Ages uh, cathedral in France, there is a labyrinth at the entrance on the, on the, on the, on the floor. And so is, uh, there is one at the cathedral in Amiens, also in France. So I guess uh, in the Middle Ages, the, the Christians were not afraid of the provocation of the, of the labyrinth which is a rather pagan symbol. Built in Japan by Arakawa and uh, his, uh, his partner, Madeleine Jean. Can you imagine the cost of this thing? And I, I don't know who paid for this. Anyway, they built it. I uh, really, I'm envious of these people, you know, of the degree of freedom they had, you know, and I don't know what kind of a society they lived in that, you know, allow them to, to do these things. Now, the Reversible Destiny Foundation, Unrealized Projects, uh, just so, shows three uh, images and we uh, will end the presentation on Arakawa is this tower which uh, they didn't yet uh, build. Maybe it will be built, but um, 
it's interesting, no? Uh, it is clear to me that they had the joy of discovery. And when you when you have the ability to express yourself with uh, with your dreams, with your longings, um, with your desires, uh, wonderful things come into being. But I don't know why certain countries and certain societies and certain schools uh, are are uh, arresting. Uh, this uh, expression of, of the human freedom and the, the, the human imagination in the name of what? To make our life more miserable than it actually is because life is difficult for all of us. And through creativity, we can uh, at least create an illusion that uh, life is truly worth uh, living and uh, enjoyable. But somehow, we allow all kinds of mechanisms to, um, you know, frustrate us and, and, and make our life uh, at times unbearable. Why? When it could be joyous. I mean, look at these two people. Maybe they were mad, but we need, we need this kind of creative madness, I would say, badly. Okay, so now we go to the third uh, person we celebrate today, and that is a real architect this time, um, Hermann Herzberger. Uh, we have with us a specialist, if she's still here, in Hermann Herzberger from London, Alexandra Krivitz. Alexandra, if you feel like saying something, please do so. Um, I uh, prepared myself a presentation. He built a lot, and his office is still um, active. And not just the office, but himself. Uh, but I, I chose a few works, especially from the beginning of his uh, career, because I like those more, actually. Uh, but I, I'll show a few works also from, uh, you know, the present, so to speak. Hermann Herzberger, happy birthday to you. He's 89 years old today and still kicking. Hermann Herzberger, you see, born the 6th of July. 1932 is one of the most famous Dutch architects, Professor Emeritus and the last Dutch architect to receive the prestigious Royal Gold Medal. Herzberger is one of the oldest active Dutch architects. This is something I will add myself now. Herzberger is also an architect admired by Kenneth Frampton. So this was the man when he was younger. <laughs> he doesn't look uh, exceptionally happy, but um, anyway, with a typical haircut of, uh, actually, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think in the 60s, yes. Um, anyway, this Dutch, some drawings. He, uh, I, would, I would say his architecture is a structuralist architecture. He, he, he works with a grid, <clears throat> he works with structure, but he's able to break it somehow. And uh, you see even in this drawing that he's, uh, he's breaking, the, he's breaking the, the confines of the, of the structure uh, he started with, and, and he does this all the time. Um, What is remarkable, I would say, about his architecture is that when I prepared this material kind of in a hurry because I didn't have one already prepared, so I had since yesterday to today, I had to make this PowerPoint presentation and it's really uh, a partial one. It, it needs to be developed. Um, I realized that he's one of the few architects where the life within the building is more than important than the building. I remember Toyo Ito saying that he wanted, you know, most architects love to take pictures of their buildings or buildings in general without people in them, but that he wanted to create an architecture where the highest potential of the building is achieved with the people within it. 
And I would say this is the case with Hermann Herzberger. That's why you'll see a number of pictures here where actually you don't see so much the building, but the life of the people within the building. Uh, this is particularly uh, surprising for an architect or an architecture which seems to be, as I said, a structuralist. Like you see here, you know, it's uh, this uh, conglomerate of cubes and squares and so on. But somehow he's able to, to, to stir up the, the life within the structure that transcends the limitations of the structure. Now this there are here is almost almost like a scarpa drawing, not this one, but uh, what's going on here almost. So you, you can see the system, right? The system is, is obvious. But then he erodes the system somehow. And uh, the result is um, positive for the life of the people using the system. So the system doesn't dwarf the life within it. And, and, and this is uh, not an easy thing to do, particularly when you, when you use strong syst formal system, like, like he does sometimes, like in this case. The Montessori school in Delft, 1960, 1966. So this school designed in 1960 and extended several times since has a spatial articulation that permits activities to take place simultaneously without one disturbing the other. The classrooms, which are L-shaped, so as to articulate different zones of concentration, together generate a complementary wide central corridor which meanders diagonally through the building. Much attention has also been given to the external zone and the entrances creating spaces which can be used in many ways. Every effort has been made to soften the threshold between the outside world and the school. The playground is not closed off and can be used by the local children after school hours. I like this building, you know, and um, you see how it is built. There are no useless finishes, you know, the, 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 the wall is not hidden behind the so-called finishes. And, and uh, there is a level of sincerity, which I admire. And which is so important for children because they, I mean, look at these girls. They are obviously playing and there is another girl here. And I love this picture, you know, and can we make through our own architecture certain, certain children be, be, be playful and enjoying themselves in this way? You know, it, it's, you would say, so what's so special here? Well, I think he was able to bring mystery into the structure in a way. And the children react to this, you know, this window was made in a certain way, narrow and tall and, uh, the, I don't know if I explain well now, but I have his feeling. I have this feeling that his architecture is uh, uh, only apparently uh, governed by uh, by reason, and that behind this appearance there are other concerns. Maybe there is some kind of a labyrinthine uh, thinking 
uh, at work here too, just like in Arakawa's work, but manifested uh, uh, formally very differently. In essence, artists, poets, mathematicians, maybe even doctors, architects, if they are good, they should all strive for freedom. But unfortunately, this is not happening. So very often it's not happening. Now the Montessori school itself as, a, as, a, as an innovative school uh, is interesting. You know, look, because they, they, they want to create, to, to create, yes, to create human beings which appreciate and uh, exercise freedom. I mean, just compare this school with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, the terrifying classrooms in, most, in, in, in some schools that I know of and I, I, I went through myself, you know, with the line tables and so on. Here is a different spirit. It's a, it's a spirit of creativity, of freedom, of playfulness. And the children, of course, enjoy it. And they are allowed to enjoy it. It's more than they, that they allow them, they, they are allowed, they, that they are allowed to enjoy it, but they are encouraged to enjoy it. And, and these children will become adults who are without inhibitions, who are creative, and those adults are actually those many architects and artists that uh, the Netherlands give to the world because they are formed in a, in a different kind of school system that is uh, encouraging uh, uh, open-mindedness and, and, and freedom uh, and so on. It saddens me that this is not the case everywhere. And you see here within the system, 1960, 1966, 1968, the thing is growing and then 1970. And it's like a geometrical reptile, you know, that, that develops. And, uh, and Diagon, Diog, Diog, Diagon experimental housing in Delft, 1967, 1970, those miraculous years when uh, the world, uh, especially the world of the young, was in turmoil, protesting against war, that war that destroyed the beautiful department store by Dudok and other similar wars, uh, protested against the obsession with money. It, it was a magical period then, really, at the end of the 60s. The revolutions, 1968, Sorbonne, or the United States, that the young were, were questioning the premises of their fathers. So the idea determining, I took this text from his website, determining the, uh, by the way, his office is called AHH, uh, I guess Atelier or Architecture, Hermann Herzberger. The idea determining the carcass houses, eight prototypes of which have been built in, uh, eight prototypes of which have been built in Delft is that they are in principle incomplete. What a beautiful idea, you know, to, 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 to create an apartment or a house which is incomplete. The plan is to a certain extent indefinite so that the occupants themselves will be able to decide how to divide the space and live in it, where they will sleep and where to eat. If the composition of the family changes, the house can be adjusted and to a certain extent enlarged. What has been designed should be seen as an incomplete framework. I like this very much. Uh, the skeleton is a half product which everyone can complete according to his own needs. The house consists basically of two fixed cores with several different half-story high levels constituting the living units, which can accommodate a variety of functions, living, sleeping, study, play, relaxing, dining, etc. In each unit, uh, level, a part can be par partitioned off to make a room, the remaining area forming an indoor balcony running along the entire living room, living hall, void. These balconies, which can be furnished according to the tastes 
of the individual members of the family together constitute the living area for occupants. There is no strict division between living area and sleeping area with the imposition of so-called going upstairs. Each member of the family has his own room as part of the large communal living space. This plan represents an attempt to get away from a number of, number of persistent stereotypes which still dominate housing today. And I would agree, Mr. Herzberger, it is so. In essence, I think he was searching for the same things, uh, for example, these days, Su Fujimoto is searching, uh, you know, to act in between function and no function. So to leave spaces uh, incomplete and with, a, with an unspecified uh, uh, function to, to allow life to manifest itself uh, beyond uh, you know, the prescriptive uh, obsessions of the architect or uh, client or whatever. In essence, it's about the same thing, the quest for freedom. Freedom of choices. And I, I imagine living in such a house, you become yourself if you are not already open-minded. Because there are no specified areas, you know, like indeed going upstairs, meaning going to your little bedroom. Here is unclear, you know, where is the bedroom? You know, where is the living room? The living room is in the bedroom and the bedroom in the living room. There are no divisions between various functions, although areas of interest uh, are configured by the, by, by the inhabitants in the process of living. No, this is a, an office, uh, if, we, if we can call it so, an office building, 1968, again, the magical 1968, 1972. From the outside and from above, it seems very deterministic because of these cubes. But you'll see inside there is an unexpected degree of freedom. An office building as workspace for 1,000 people designed as a single articulated unit consisting of 60 tower-like cubes connected on each floor by overpasses. The extensive central street area in which the space is equally developed in vertical and horizontal direction calls to mind the street pattern of medieval town, the labyrinth. I would add. Also, the materials of the glass roofed liners in space evoke an outdoor atmosphere. In each corner, there is a place to have coffee, to relax, or to hold meetings. The illumination throughout is an integral part of the architecture, in this case, conceived in terms of street lighting. The transparency and lightness of the metal stairs, together with the glass brick fillings, create a harmonious contrast with the heavily dimensioned main structure of the building. We try to arrive at the wealth of formal expression by using simple, sober means to create a feeling of spaciousness, even when working on a small scale. And again, I, I, I mentioned uh, when I began talking about Herzberger, 
uh, in his case, these human scenes of human simple activities are very important. You know, two people playing chess here on a modest uh, chess table, this man reading the newspaper, drinking his coffee. How often do we show such scenes of life as lived in our architectures? Not often. Uh, uh, but in his case, this is important. And you see how the erosion of the way life erodes the system from within. I call these positive erosions. If the Latin said, Ars longa vita brevis, art is long and life is short, reversing and uh, paraphrasing uh, in reference to architecture, we could say uh, architecture is short and life is long. which would be an, an unusual premise an architect starts from, because usually architects think the other way, you know, that, that the building is, uh, you know, the sumum and whatever life happens there is less important. But in the case of Herzberger, and this is perplexing that he uses strong systems, and yet you feel that, that what he's actually searching for is not the system, is within the system is the life itself of the people who use it. And look at this interior. Yes, it, it is, uh, uh, in a way, maybe it's not so different what we look at here from uh, certain aspects of Arakawa's work. You know, there is, uh, there's might be a confusion here, but, but this confusion is actually an expression of the richness of life and the hybridity of life, and, and we, we should welcome this hybridity as much as possible. This uh, he was and is an excellent architect, Hermann Herzberger. Uh, again, from the outside, to, to my taste, is a little bit deterministic, uh, this, um, you know, conglomerate of cubes, but uh, within is something else. I mean, you know, this structure, this, uh, you know, was, was built by these uh, human ants, you know, in a way, building their own uh, uh, temple of work and life and living. He uses a strong geometry, but then he erodes this geometry through, uh, through uh, an almost medieval feeling about uh, articulating spaces and creating uh, uh, e even a sense of disorientation within the system. But that so-called disorientation is connected with what uh, Frank Gehry, for example, called insecurity, the happy insecurity. Here we also see happy insecurities. A music center in Utrecht, 1973-1978, rather than trying to distinguish itself as a temple of music, the building situated on a market square seeks to be absorbed by the city informally as an integral part of it. The music center is accessible from the surrounding shopping arcade. The intimate dimensions refer to 19th century Parisian arcades. We do not derive the forms from the past, but rather the articulation and atmosphere. Columns occur in many lengths, but with their capital-like heads, they constitute a form family helping to establish an architectural so-called order throughout the building. There is relatively, relatively little differentiation in the materials used inside and outside their finish and proportions, except that the walls of the foyer are finished with wood and specially designed wall uh, tapestries. The main concert hall is designed to accommodate a variety of uses. The idea that a good view contributes to good listening gave rise to the amphitheater form, 
while the configuration in the round not only brings players and audience closer, but keeps the distance between speaker and listener to a minimum. The foyers are fairly minimal too, as a result of over cramped building lines, but have a wealth of places on, uh, on offer. These range from introverted corners where one can withdraw from the crowd and places where one has an over, overall view of things to others giving you a glimpse into the auditorium of the town outside. So it's the building as an organism. It starts with a system, but then it is eroded from within mainly. And, uh, and uh, the fact that there are those spaces that he mentions of uh, introversion within the collectiveness of the building is, is remarkable and, and very positive. So in essence, we have here multiplicity in unity. It's a large space where a large uh, group of people, a collectivity can, can gather, but also there are pockets of individuality and even introversion. And again, we see children, you know, many times children in, he, in the, well, these pictures were chosen by his office, by himself, but it does say something that there are so many children who are kind of alert, running. You wouldn't expect this in a concert hall, in a music, uh, you know, music, uh, in a temple of music. This is not a temple of music. This is a temple of life where music is serving life and everybody is enjoying uh, the, 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 the meeting between the freedom of music and the freedom of a life lived outside the confines of dogma. And also there are various functions here. You know, I, I like this informality and I'm really envious of these Dutch. They, they, they know something that other people don't. They are really free. The musicians as, as real persons, I mean, elegant, it's true, but themselves, you know, real people. Nice, good work. And then you have these uh, labyrinthine, uh, you know, uh, areas, you know, where these bridges and uh, again, children, you know, lots of children here, you know, in most uh, houses of music, you don't see children. Here you see children. In a way, it's in, it is an anti-temple. It's, it appears at first to be monolithical, but it's actually not. Uh, yeah. Because he sabotages unique readings, uh, totalitarian readings, and, and this is a quality, an important quality he has. Another Montessori school, this, um, this time from 1980, 1983 in Amsterdam, uh, so both schools resulted from the same brief as assigned by the government and as they were developed from principles as identical twins, they also show great similarities. The very, there are two buildings, the very limited building site, beautifully situated in a spacious green area, inspired to make villa style buildings. Thus, from an urban planning point of view, matching the, the ideas and large detached houses. Also, the interior of both schools fits to the image of a large house with the classrooms grouped around the large hall space, opening up to the heart of the school, the central place for all events that ingress out of the separate classrooms. Uh, Gabriel Gatehouse in 2017 reported for the BBC from the Netherlands where he grew up. Uh, anyway, um, so these are the buildings, this is one, and then you see both of them. Again, the typical 
Hermann Herzberger interior, which is uh, which shows his great ability to to almost to decompose the the system, to sabotage the system, and create variety and unity vertically and horizontally, and so. So there are areas of the building that communicate uh, in, in, in various ways. And I think this is very important because it stirs up your imagination. It creates in you a desire to communicate. Uh, it, it's, it's an invitation towards communication. And, uh, and uh, as such, this is a great uh, quality for a building. And you see, again, people feeling at home in an institutional building. This uh, boy with his back towards us left his shoes on the floor, or maybe one of them, they all left their shoes somewhere and they play chess. Many people here, I mean, the children or adults seem to be playing. And look, look, look how free he is, you know. And why is it that in our schools, in our country, this is not possible, you know? Uh, immediately someone would scream at the child, don't, don't do this, don't touch this with your foot, or, uh, you know, ay, ay, ay. They enjoy themselves. And these, these children as well. Look, you know, they, I, I mean, how many schools in Romania allow children to be like this? I didn't see many images uh, similar to this one. Uh, from schools here. Now, here everything is, you can do this even in a university, you know? Why is it that in the Netherlands they can do it? Because they are free and because they advocate freedom and they believe in freedom, that's why. And that's why they have great architects and that's why they have great artists, that's why. <laughs> And playfulness is important, of course, for children and for adults alike. And when you create engaging spaces, of course, you engage the imagination of the children. And I think you engage also the imagination of the, of the, of the people taking care of the children, you know, call them teachers or whatever you might want to call them, the, because they are, they are stimulated as well. But when the spaces are restrictive, uh, you know, uh, then uh, everybody is inhibited and inhibiting. In essence, uh, the plan of the building is not, uh, at least at the first reading, it's not, uh, uh, you know, flamboyantly uh, expressing, uh, you know, an exasperating kind of freedom. It's still controlled, but but within, again, within the structure, Herzberger creates something else. See, the drawings seem to be less interesting than the, the actual images of the building. You, know, you look at this uh, section and you look at the plans, but, but, but the pictures of the life taking place within the building show uh, an increased complexity. And uh, maybe you see, you, know, you, 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 you see here the details of certain joinings or joints that, that, that he, he was concerned about. And this, this uh, concern for a, a variety of, of, of joints uh, shows his ability to, to, um, uh, to, to, to create a balance between uh, what is called multiplicity and what is called the unity. Variety in unity, that's what we have. The Ministry of Social Welfare and Employment in The Hague, 1979 to 1990, this is a governmental building. And uh, so this office building for over 2000 people is organized into individual spaces for nearly, nearly everyone. The building structure consists of repeating units, thereby avoiding the endless corridors 
that occur in so many office blocks. On the side facing the railway embankment, the office spaces would best be situated high up so as to have a view over the embankment. On the other side, the building has been kept as low as possible to conform to the height of the housing in this area. Instead of an architectural volume containing vast office spaces, we opted for an articulation into different building sections so that the volume is as it were distributed uh, over a number of separate buildings grouped along an, uh, uh, the elongated central area. A number of smaller office buildings together constituting a whole. Well, what he's saying here at the, the end of this text is exactly what I was trying to refer to. A number of smaller office buildings together constituting a whole. In other words, multiplicity in unity. Each of these more or less self-contained office buildings can accommodate one or more departments, each being individually accessible from the central area. All these departments or combinations, I think the word combination is, uh, is uh, particularly relevant to his work, of departments are arranged as autonomous units about a glass covered vertical space that extends over three floors. The vertical spaces are to be situated along one of the exterior facades in such a way that all workspaces have an unobstructed view of the outside. And these are the buildings. It's a system again, uh, but uh, it almost looks like a, a model now. Uh, at first I thought it is a model, but this, these are the actual uh, built buildings. And the power of the diagonal and the cross, the crossings, he, he seemed to like crossings, he likes the cube, he likes diagonal, so he rotates the cube, so, and, and, and here he obtained a lot, obtains a lot of freedom using essentially uh, a rather simple uh, system of articulations. And again and again, the magic happens indoors, you know, where you have street, balcony, uh, passages, uh, staircases, uh, ramps, and so on. So it's 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 the it's the stomach of the building that constitutes the the, the main interest. And again, life, people talking sitting, looking at each other, living. So architecture is mainly a background against which life takes place. So this is an architecture serving life as opposed to have a, a building where life serves architecture. And yet from above and from the exterior, uh, it, it seems the system is rigid but he achieves freedom within the system. And it's because of those uh, erosions that I mentioned, mainly spatial, but also functional erosions. And the, the drawing seems to be rather, you know, cold and predictable, but the reality of the building is actually different. And again, this kind of, uh, uh, drawing with all kinds of combinations, you know, uh, uh, articulations, uh, joints, and so on. Uh, it is here that he is able to, to bring the multi multiplicity in, the variety in. Now, this is the model, of course. He 
in essence, they are open systems. That's what they are, his buildings. A community center uh, in Arnhem from 2009 to 2012. Uh, the, so the community center consists of the former doctor, both school, with a new annex, the users and representatives of the neighborhood platform were closely involved in the design. The existing monumental building from the 1922 from 1922 was renovated and expanded with an annex incorporated in the landscape. The weathering offers shelter to those uh, um, you know, institutions. Uh, the neighborhood shop and the gym, the police cons consultation hours takes place here too. By using a building together, the different institutions can work together better and activities for neighborhood residents be matched. So we see the, the hybrid, hybridity that concerns him and the conjunction of uh, even uh, apparently opposite uh, either entities or activities. And um, this is the, the building from the 1920s. And that's the main reason, actually, I chose this work from, from a large body of work. Uh, initially, I saw that this was done by him. But no, this is the building from the 1920s. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a convincing building. And he built around it, uh, you know, as you see, uh, these are his interve interventions. The old and the new together for the delight of the trees and the grass and the sky. So we, we saw the brickwork in the case of Dudok. Now we see the brickwork of, of an architect whose name I do not know, but also from the 1920s in the Netherlands. And then the additions of a contemporary architect who is 89 years old, and his name is Hermann Herzberger. And now an extension. I have one or two images here. Uh, this is the last work I showed today. Uh, of a, of a um, theater cafe or something from 2016, 2020. So it's a very recent work. Last year, of course, he was 88 years old and he's still working. So this uh, chasse theater designed by A.H.H., meaning Atelier Hermann Herzberger, will, or architecture uh, Hermann Herzberger will get extra cinemas. These cinemas will be added as new rounded volumes to the existing building, making them visible in the lobby. Both spaces will accommodate about 50 people. To make the cinemas accessible, a new staircase will be added, which will swing through the fire. The stairs not only serve to go quickly to the cinema spaces, but the visitor moves upwards together with the staircase and sees a spectacle unfolding below of the free form fire and the other visitors. Cinema visit becomes more than just watching a movie. It's also watching each other, seeing and being seen an evening out. I like this. So it's not a cinema just to watch movies, but also to watch each other and see each other and maybe talk to each other and being together. And uh, here is, uh, I, I, I think, at the, at the time when, uh, when this material was presented on his website, the whole building was not yet completed. I don't know, but I, I have one, one or two images. And I, I find the same uh, hybridity and viscerality as it was shown in most of the works I chose to show today. And in most of his uh, 
uh, better works. And I think this is a quality he had. Uh, again, the building serving life and not the other way around. Thank you and happy birthday, Hermann Herzberger. <laughs>